Dobrý den, vítám vás na dnešní debatě, která se jmenuje Majdan svědomí Ukrajiny. Já se jmenuji Dekmar Ostřanská a budu dnešní debatu moderovat. Chtěla bych zde přivítat naše dva milé hosty, její Marcy Shore a Maxim Eristavy. Zároveň bych chtěla omluvit paní Svitlanu Zališčuk, která z Ukrajiny, ukrajinskou aktivistku a poslankyni ukrajinského parlamentu, která bohužel z důvodu nemoci se dnešní debaty nemůže zúčastnit. Já bych vám na začátku naše hosty krátce představila, sice v brožuře Melting Pot jste si něco o nich mohli přečíst, ale ještě bych něco ráda doplnila. A poté, bych, poté povedeme debatu, samozřejmě vy jste součástí dnešního odpoledne, takže se nebojte ptát na otázky. Máme tady zástupce z Ukrajiny, ukrajinského novináře a z akademické sféry Marsi Shore. Tak kdybych mohla říct několik slov o Marsi Shore. Marsi Shore je profesorka evropských kulturních a intelektuálních dějin, působí jako hostující profesorka na Jelské univerzitě. Je autorkou knih The Taste of Ashes, The Art Life of Totalitarian totalitarianism in Eastern Europe, která byla také přeložena do polštiny. A dále knihy Caviar and Ashes, Warsaw uh, Generations, Life and Death of Marxism. Za tuto knihu získala osm ocenění, mezi nimi to bylo také ocenění National Jewish Book Award. Uh, Marsi přeložila také knihu Michala Glovinského z polštiny a The Black Season. Tato kniha byla v České republice vydána v roce 2002 po Lomouckém nakladatelství. Co ještě dodat? Marsi nyní pracuje na knize pod názvem It was my choice, the revolution in Ukraine. Napsala řadu odborných statí a publikuje ve světových médiích, jako je New York Times. Pokud se seznámit se, se s její tvorbou, tak samozřejmě na Amazonu a si můžete knihy pořídit. A nyní bych přišla k Maximovi. A Maxim Eristavy, jak jsem řekla, je ukrajinský novinář. Já se musím přehodit teď poznámky, které jsem si udělala k Maximovi. A je to spoluzakladatel televizní stanice Hromadské International. Je to asi patří mezi nejznámější anglicky píšící ukrajinské novináře. Zabývá se tématikou LGBT na Ukrajině a novinařině se věnuje od svých 17 let, kdy začal pracovat v rádiu v Záporoží, což je jeho rodné město na východní Ukrajině. Poté také pracoval v rádiu Svoboda v Kijevě a okolo roku 2012 se přesunul do Moskvy, kde pracoval pro rádio a teď se to hlasu Ruska. Krátce před vypuknutím Majdanu v listopadu 2013 se Maxim ocitl zpět na Ukrajině. Neberme to jako nějakou náhodu, náhody neexistují. A začal pokrývat události, které se na Majdanu odehrávají. Já bych teď poprosila naše milé hosty, aby víme, že na Ukrajině se stalo v posledních deseti letech několik takových závažných událostí. Jednou z nich byla pomerančová revoluce v roce 2004 a druhou z nich byla, byl Majdan. Já bych je požádala o krátké možná srovnání těch dvou událostí, v čem se lišily, co měly společného, proč například rok 2004 pravděpodobně nesplnilo očekávání ukrajinské společnosti protože v roce 2013 se objevujeme znovu na Majdanu. Takže prosím o krátké takové srovnání těchto dvou stěžejních událostí moderní ukrajinské historie. Tak prosím, kdo se ujme slova? Děkuji yeah, um, so much again um, for coming and thank you so much for inviting. Um, I think that usually when we look at the events that have been happening in Ukraine in the last uh, 10 years, uh, we always compare it to revolution, uh, revolutions. And the country went through two very massive revolutions. And one wasn't very big success, unfortunately. The second one, and the thing to understand about the second one that is still happening, it's 
Yeah, it's still happening. It's still the process. Uh, that's why sometimes, to if you look at the events uh, there uh, in Ukraine, it's a bit confusing sometimes. And it's uh, if you actually meet anyone who can deliver a final verdict on the Maidan revolution at the moment, probably they don't know what they talk about. Because at the same point, you know, even my, myself, I, I follow the events every day, 24 seven for the last two and a half years. I cannot deliver your final verdict just because I know that the process is still happening. But the, taking a larger picture of two revolutions and two events that shaped the modern history of Ukraine, I think that it's important to get the idea why they keep happening. And in my personal opinion, I think that they keep happening just because people are not so uh, keen to vote or to uh, believe in the politics of ideologies, but instead they keep uh, appointing those saviors and heroes and they are very addicted to politics of personalities. And if you have politics of personalities in a country that was, you know, hasn't been reformed for 25 years, it, it means that there are gonna be high expectations, too high, and people will be disappointed one way or another uh, in their politicians, and then it goes in a very political death cycle. When new icons emerge, they obviously are not able to deliver just based on their personalities, their lack of politics of ideologies instead, and they fail, and then frustration adds up. In the end, you have one revolution, and you have constant political crisis, and you have another revolution, and, and so on and so on. So I think the problem is very universal for our, the whole region of Eastern and Central Europe, that we're not very, um, very familiar with the concept of policies and ideologies, and instead we root for just strong personalities, and that's not something that works very well when you need to reform uh, the country in a very dramatic way. Okay, I should first say that, you know, I, unlike, unlike Maxim, I come to this as, as an outsider. Um, this was not my revolution, I'm not Ukrainian. I'm not a completely neutral outsider because as the result of having now spent my entire adult life, the past quarter century or so, hanging around in Eastern Europe, I, I have a lot of friends and colleagues here. Um, so with that caveat, let me say that I was, I watched the Orange Revolution of 2004 with interest and curiosity, but I was not seduced by it. Um, it didn't pull me in. I mean, I was curious. Um, I, I hoped it would go well, but it wasn't, it wasn't an existential transformation. What I saw, you know, from a distance as an outsider um, in 2013 and 2014, that winter, you know, watching the Maidan was the single most extraordinary thing I have ever seen in the 25 years I've been coming to Eastern Europe. You know, that was not just a political transformation, that was truly an existential transformation. You know, Václav Havel, to the day he died, you know, kept saying that he was waiting for the existential revolution. You know, and Adam Micknick kept saying, we need metaphysics. This is a civilization that needs metaphysics. We've lost metaphysics. You know, we've fallen victim to consumerism and to illusions that global capitalism and neoliberalism will fix all our problems. We need the return of metaphysics. The Maidan was the return of metaphysics. You know, it was, a, it was changes that were not only political and social, but actually existential. You saw people changing in front of you. You saw people making choices they never would have imagined of themselves that they would make. Um, and, and one of the things I, I heard from a lot of my friends, and I think there's, there's a generational component to this because I'm, I'm older than Maxime, unfortunately, although I would like to pretend to be younger, um, and considered getting my hair braided in one of those colored dreadlocks um, before this talk. But I'm, I'm unfortunately already in my 40s, so my, my friends and contemporaries in Ukraine you know, were people who very much lived through and took part in the Orange Revolution already as adults, you know, already in their late 20s or early 30s. And what they kept saying is that they then felt shame. You know, that they then felt like they were naive, that they went out onto the streets, onto the Maidan for three weeks, 
And that essentially, and, and here I'm going to quote my friend Yurko Prohasco, who says this very eloquently, we thought that we were going to get rid of a bad father, and then we were going to have a good father, and he would take care of us, and then everything would be OK. And what had to happen for a real existential revolution to, to occur is that we had to stop believing there were any good parents who were going to take care of us that we had to start understanding that there was nobody who was going to come and take care of us forever. It's like Freud says the problem of God, that you know, God is this, this kind of narcissistic illusion that somebody will come and take care of us forever. You know, and that the lesson of the Orange Revolution is that there is no perfect person who is going to come save us. And if we want things to change, then we start with changing ourselves. And we have to make the change. And we have to make it every day. Now, technically, how that would happen no, nobody knew. But the change in thought. Um, the, the other thing about, about the Maidan that, um, that I, I would say that made it really very different was it was a moment of overcoming divisions that very, very rarely happens in history. There, there's, there's a famous scene from the, the Polish film Człowiek Żelaza, Man of Iron, where the son, who is one of the students in Poland who is protesting in March 1968, goes to his father, who is a shipyard worker, during the student demonstrations in 68, and asks his father to bring out the workers in support of the students. And the father says no. And he locks the son in his room, and he slaps him. And he says, when the time is right, we'll go out on the streets together. And the son is so angry, he says, no, we will never go together. And two years later, when the shipyard workers go out on the streets, the father asks the son to come, and the son says no. He says, you know, you let us down two years ago, now you go to hell. And the miracle that was Solidarność in Poland was the miracle of not only the Catholics and the Marxists and the left and the right um, and the workers and the intellectuals, but also the fathers and the sons. And one of the extraordinary things that I think turned what could have been just a protest mostly by young people you know, about a political issue concerning the European Union and Ukraine's relationship to the European Union into a revolution was this moment you know, on November 30th where the riot police come out and they beat the students. And my sense was that Yanukovych was counting on the fact that now the parents will come and pull their kids off the street. And that's the critical moment when that doesn't happen. Instead, the parents join the kids on the street. You know, and people kept saying to me, we cannot let them beat our children. We cannot let them beat our children. Even pe people said this to me who didn't have children themselves. But that became this sense of the older generation going out and uniting with the young generation, the overcoming of decades of Oedipal rebellion, you know, and the start of this very rare, very ephemeral, very precious moment when you overcome these divisions. Um, can I just, to add to this, I think it's important because when we talk about Maidan revolution or Orange revolution, especially abroad, sometimes it's very in general terms. So I, I keep telling this, my personal story, and um, I'm coming from a very poor background in Eastern Ukraine. I was robbed of so many uh, economic, social opportunities. So obviously, at some point, you know, since I was a kid, I hated my country so bad. That's why I actually left my country. And I, would try, I was trying to find a better life somewhere else. And the country hated me back just because I was poor or a gay kid. But I remember then, and I covered the first revolution, uh, Orange Revolution, as a young reporter. And I was, you know, uh, harassed by police and I was detained. So it was quite nasty. But I didn't have the same feeling as I had during the Maidan revolution. And actually, I came back to Ukraine just a month before Maidan revolution. And suddenly it happens, you know, and I'm fascinated as a journalist. I, start, I started covering for foreign media as an observer. I, I didn't actually, I didn't, um, I wasn't feeling anything at the moment except just being professional trying to cover the event. But what happened in, during especially months after the revolution, that it was the first time that I actually felt that I can contribute something to the process and I can be helpful and actually I'll be, I can be an agent of change in you know, a specific area doing microscopic input, but still it's possible. For me, 
you know, 20 year, uh, eight year old man back then, it was absolutely mind blowing. But what was m more importantly, that people that I saw, young politicians joined the parliament or the government or just civil society, they actually also saw something valuable in me back. And it was the moment when we first connect, me and my country, which is something very unusual for me and very moving. And it didn't happen just with me. I know that my parents that, you know, are very kind of representative of all generation and the blue collar workers from Soviet, Soviet times, they were completely, I mean, they weren't very supportive of Orange Revolution. But when the Maidan Revolution uh, happened, my father, who is like one of the most conservative people I've ever met, and you know, quite, uh, quite pro-Russian before that, he, I saw this dramatic change with him as a, you know, uh, as a man, as a personality, and he's 20, 55 years old, and suddenly in two years, he's a completely changed man. I mean, he wants to, obviously he's very patriotic, he wants to join the army to fight in the East because he feels very insecure and very uh, sensitive towards invasion. He uh, supports, uh, he, you know, he criticizes the government, but he supports reforms and, and stuff like that. So it's, it, you're, tr you're absolutely right. Those are profound changes in the society. I'm not naive enough to kind of try to say to you that, you know, that's done deal, that has completely changed society. Maybe in two years it will be massive rollback. But I think it's important to understand that it's the first time in the country's 25 year history that something like that is happening inside society. It's not just about economic reforms or social reforms or just uh, a general progress. It's something that it's happening and boiling inside uh, people's minds. Děkuji uh, moc. Já mám takovou otázku na Maxima. Maxime, ty vy jste zmínil, že uh, je to o lídrech. Uh, má Ukrajina nové lídry mezi mladou generací? Často jsem se setkávala s takovým názorem, že um, nejsme Češi, my nemáme Václava Havla, nejsme Poláci, nemáme Lecha Valencu. Uh, jak je to teda s Ukrajinou nyní? Um, it is a very frustrating um, topic, I guess. And I, um, as I travel more and more, this is something personally that I'm very interested to find a question, uh, to find an answer for, because I think when it comes to our generation of young people, it's quite similar everywhere that we don't have this feeling and. Um, passion for participation in the political process. So very, usually we are very involved uh, in uh, debates, uh, but at the same time when it comes to taking responsibility and becoming one of those politicians or leaders in, in civil society or in politics, we're not there. So after the revolution, obviously a lot of young people participated in the revolution. They, they were part of a, uh, civil society groups or just regular citizens. They, they were very effective at recruiting people and empowering them and leading. But when the, uh, the violent and the, the turbulent part of the revolution ended, and then the, the process of transitioning from street fighters to actual po politicians started, not so many people joined the movement. You know, they, they took a back seat and you know, so few young politicians who actually got in the parliament, it's very important to understand that it's the first time in the Ukraine's history that we see so many of them, right, joining the parliament. And like Svetlana, that she's unfortunately not here, and other politicians, we have, um, I think we have maybe 20% of, uh, of a, uh, new parliament that is quite young. But at the same time, it's not enough in numerical uh, proportion. And this, the most interesting thing that those young politicians are very involved on Facebook, they're very open, you know, they uh, talk to their constituencies and, you know, um, uh, voters. But the biggest amount of um, negative comments and the, the biggest amount of criticizing comes from young people. So if you go on their Facebook profiles, you can see like, tens of thousands comments and they mostly come from young people saying like, you're not good enough or I don't believe you and, stu and then stuff like that, which for me is very frustrating in a way that 
it's it's right thing to criticize, but at the same time, sometimes I don't feel like we participate enough uh, and take responsibility and be uh, you know be shaping our own future. We got to fix this because otherwise, what's the point of just uh, being uh, on the back seat and just observing how older people creating future for us instead of us creating future for ourselves. Thank you. A nyní bych se... Je, yeah, je. Yeah. Ještě má si něco dodat. I, I just want to add something to what, what Maxime said about responsibility and politics because that's that's been one of, the, I think, the most difficult things about the transition um, after the Maidan. You know, one of the reasons, in some strange way, the Maidan was so resonant for me, even though I was not in Eastern Europe in the 70s and the 80s, I was then really too young, um, was, it was it was a revisiting in a new way of conversations that people like Václav Havel and Adam Miknik and the signatories of Harta Sedum de Sat Sedum had been having in the 70s and 80s, and in particular about responsibility. You know, Jan Patochka liked to say that the thing about responsibility is that we carry it with us everywhere. It's not something that sometimes is there and sometimes it's not. You know, it's, it's part of our, our existential essence. Um, Adam Miknik used the phrase Jacobi um, as if, slightly differently from the way Havel used it to say that our moral obligation is to live as if we were free people and bore responsibility for all our actions, regardless of any constraints. You know, and that was what Havel meant in his famous speech that he gives before the American Congress in February 1990 right after the Velvet Revolution where he famously says, consciousness precedes being and not the other way around, as the Marxists claim. Now, of course, no one in the American Congress had any idea what he was talking about. But, um, but it, the Marxist idea that being precedes consciousness, that how you think um, and how you feel is simply derivative, kind of uh, mechanically derivative of your social, political, and economic position. And when Havel says consciousness precedes beings, he means no, we are free to define ourselves in a way that is prior to and transcendent of any kind of social, economic, or political constraints. That there's a basic human freedom of the spirit you know, for which we bear responsibility regardless of, of any kind of repression of the system. And for me, the Maidan was a revisiting of that idea of responsibility. You know, the idea of the responsibility being something that is with us, that is with us every single day and every single minute and with, every, with, with everything we do. Um, and it was really the creation of, of a parallel polis, you know, of a whole, not only an alternative political program, or really not so much an alternative political program, but an alternative world, you know, in which there were kitchens and there were open lectures, you know, and there was food distribution and there were medical clinics. And I think that the problem or the, the I don't know if problem is the right word, it's perhaps too banal a word, but the difficulty then is taking that kind of existential, spiritual sense of responsibility that the Maidan was proof can be achieved, you know, at least in the realm of the spirit. And how do you then translate that, you know, into some kind of representative political system? I think that is the, the kind of million dollar question of, of the moment that, that has not been answered. Thank you, Marci, for the answer. Maidan, of course, has already mentioned Maxim, has been born or has tím, že nebyla podepsána asociační dohoda v Litvě v roce 2013. Prezident Janukovič nepodepsal asociační dohodu. A dalším důvodem určitě byla korupce, která je velkým tématem na Ukrajině. Podle indexu vnímání korupce ve veřejném sektoru podle Transparency International je Ukrajina na 130. místě data z konce roku 2015. Já bych se ráda zeptala teď Maxima, jak situace vypadá na Ukrajině. Samozřejmě neočekávám žádná převratná čísla, ale co se děje v oblasti korupce na Ukrajině, jestli byly zřízeny nějaké komise vládní, nevládní, 
jestli už máte nějaké příklady efektivního bohy s korupcí na Ukrajině. Well, you see, you, you say that you don't expect any breakthrough, and it's very naive to expect any breakthrough in two years. Um, at the same time, I think you rightly point out uh, the importance of uh, EU trade deal, and it was Catalysis moment for the revolution. Not because, and it's important to um, point out, not because people in Ukraine are so naive to believe that, you know, they're going to be the part of EU anytime soon. That's not the case, and it wasn't the case for revolution, because there is a massive mis a misconception of the revolution that it happened just because of EU trade deal and because Ukrainians want to join EU. That wasn't the case. The case was that there was a growing frustration with corruption, a lack of first and foremost, lack of justice of any kind, uh, when the courts are not accessible for you as an um, equal citizen, and then economic issues because Ukraine entered revolution after already at least four years of constant recessions. So obviously people were quite frustrated. But the issue with EU integration, but most importantly harmonization of uh, EU laws when it comes to partnership with the Eastern countries, unfortunately, or for better or worse, um, I think for better, uh, sometimes in 99% in cases for countries like Moldova, Ukraine, or Georgia to go through the process of EU harmonization uh, um, and EU law harmonization is the only chance to bypass your corrupt oligarchic elites and actually de deliver some change on the ground. Uh, as a part of a massive trade-off, economic trade-off. And sometimes local elites, it's not that, especially oligarchic elites, it's not that they don't want uh, more opportunities inside the European Union or trade with the European Union. Sometimes for them, it's just on a generational level or level of fear, they're not able to allow themselves to, uh, to go through those reforms. But if it's a part of a trade-off and the society is, on, uh, the society is also uh, on board with it, it goes much more smoother. So when it comes to anti-corruption reforms, Ukraine created uh, five new anti-corruption bodies since the revolution. Uh, the number is not so important because as my colleague just a month ago from Uganda told me that they have 17 anti-corruption bodies in Uganda and they're still, Uganda is one of the ho most horrible places for, uh, for, for uh, anti-corruption fight. But at the same time, as we know from history, creating institutions is crucially important. Once you create this institution, then it's in place. It's very hard to get rid of it. The other you know, uh, complicated question is how to make it work and be effective. It's another, um, it's another task, but at the same time, it's important that they are there. And those institutions are in place in most cases because of the uh, pressure of the European Union. I know that sometimes we treat your, uh, the pressure of the European Union as ineffective and based on their foreign policy, and it's true that European foreign policy is quite upsetting, and you know, basically you cannot say for sure that if there is any such thing as EU foreign policy at the moment. But I think that there on the ground, I saw so many processes that are not public, but at the same time, they're happening every day. You know, special programs, again, uh, harmonization of legislation, uh, then some, uh, all the, that to-do list that you uh, gotta go through if you want a EU trade deal, or visa-free regime. It delivers actual change on the ground. For example, procurement reform. It's one of the most exciting things that is happening in Ukraine in the last two years. Ukraine is launching uh, this August, the online platform that is already award-winning and a lot of countries come to Ukraine and try to uh, replicate and, you know, uh, take it back to their homes because the moment it launches, it doesn't matter, I mean, I hope it's going to be successful, but it doesn't matter uh, whether it's successful or not. To the date, this is the most progressive procurement reform in the world in terms of openness, in terms of uh, control of civil society over the uh, process of uh, state contracts and so on and so on. And it happened mostly not because the elites decided to do so or not because civil society created this reform, but in larger part because EU was there as a pushing force saying that without it, 
we cannot move forward and we cannot you know, trade uh, without borders and we, uh, we cannot allow your citizens to cross borders without passports. So I think this process is always underappreciated and I think it's more visible not even in Ukraine because Ukraine is so uh, big, but if you look at countries like Georgia or Moldova where you can see, especially in Moldova, where you can see such a difference between American foreign policy and EU foreign policy, where Americans give this unconditional support for corrupt oligarchic elites that can rob countries, steal 10% of GDP in one day, and still uh, get an access to State Department. But when it comes to EU, I remember this quite clearly a year before the revolution, Moldova went through the same process of, you know, checking all the boxes in the process of uh, EU uh, visa-free regime. And one law was anti-discrimination legislation. So in Moldova, they decided that they will uh, pass something that is being called anti-discrimination legislation, but, you know, in, uh, as a basis, it wasn't the, the case. So they passed it through the parliament. It, they were very happy and excited about it. And then EU officials say, like, we're not so foolish, it's not the law that we want. And they pressed very hard for, I think it was for three months, and the parliament fought back very hard, but they made sure that this law was on books exactly as it should be, exactly with the language that uh, it needs to have. And, you know, the same happened later in Ukraine. Ukrainian parliament voted nine times before they pass this anti-discrimination legislation. So I think uh, this is important to kind of understand about the power that we have, uh, foreign power, when it comes to progressive changes inside the country. Mm -hmm. I, one of the, the things that, questions that I've always asked myself as looking as an outsider at what's going on, is I'm always trying to understand what is, what is ill will you know, what is self-interest? What is simple incompetence? Mm -hmm. you, know, um, you know, sometimes it becomes hard to disentangle corruption from in incompetence. I, one, one of the things I did last year was um, I, I spoke to some people in, in Dnipropetrovsk who were involved with the volunteer movement there. And in the East, I think the real existential transformation came after the Maidan, you know, when these cities like Dnipropetrovsk and Kharkiv and Odessa, you know, and Donetsk and Luhansk, you know, had to make a decision about how they were going to respond to the separatists and how they were going to respond to Russia. You know, and one of the ironies that struck me was that I met people who were involved in these civil society organizations that were all run by volunteers, you know, and, and not funded by the government. And they were doing all the things that governments normally do. They were resettling refugees. They were feeding and housing and clothing refugees. They were crowdfunding the Ukrainian army. You know, they were training Ukrainian soldiers in tactical medicine. They were negotiating hostage exchanges with the separatists. All these things that would, should really be done by the state were not being done by the state. Um, and they were being done by civil society that had mobilized in defense of a state perfectly well aware of the irony that they're mobilizing on the defense of a state which they have to mobilize on behalf of because the state does not function. Yeah. And, and, and it, that irony is not lost on them. You know, I, I spoke to Pavel Khazan, who had started this Fond Oboroni Kraina. He's a physicist, and he's working on training people in tactical medicine. And he says, all I want is for us to become obsolete. <laughs> you know? All I want is for the government to not need us anymore. So there's that issue. I mean, there's the incompetence issue. There's the corruption, which I'm only beginning to understand has such deep roots that nobody seems to know how, you know, where even to start. And I, I found that that also becomes a kind of existential issue. I, I spoke to these two young soldiers from Pravi sector, from this far right group, who had joined a volunteer battalion and gone to fight in the Donbass um, in the battle for the Donetsk airport, which some of you may have heard was this particular inferno, which people continued to defend even after there was really no airport left to defend. And they were part of a battalion of, of eight men, um, four of whom came back 
um, one of whom was severely injured and the other three of whom were killed, which they showed me very gruesome pictures on their cell phones. But when I tried to ask them why they had joined this battalion, why they had joined Pravi Sector, what their ideological convictions were that led them to this group, why they decided to fight, um, they kept going back to this idea of nas nie kupisz, nas nie kupisz, you know, sia prodajotsa. Like everybody sells out in this country, but you can't buy us that we eight guys who joined together, we know that we can count on one another. You know, and we know that we will not sell one another out because we're in this world in which everything can be bought. And they kept, they weren't used to talking to historians, obviously. Um, and so they were kind of thinking in real time, but they kept coming back to this idea of everybody can be bought here, everybody can be sold, everybody sells out, but you can't buy us. You know, we will stick together, you can't buy us. And this, this word in Russian, you know, for corruption, this prodajnost, it, it's literally saleability. You know, and I think it encompasses more than just dysfunctions of the government, you know, or of certain financial sectors. It's also what do you do then in this world in which you feel like perhaps everything and everybody can be bought and sold. Uh, děkuji. Já bych se zeptala publika, jestli má někdo otázku. Můžete v češtině nebo v angličtině? Nemáte zatím, tak já budu pokračovat se svými otázkami. Je to více jak dvo roky od Majdanu na východní Ukrajině stále zuří válka, i když v českých médiích už se objevuje velmi zřídka informace o tomto konfliktu. Nepocitujete na Ukrajině určitou frustraci, dva roky, tři roky, se nic moc zase tak nezměnilo. Nepocitujete frustraci toho, že Evropská unie, Evropa vás nechala na holičkách, že vlastně východní Ukrajina se stává dalším zamrzlým konfliktem na území bývalého sovětského svazu, jako je třeba Náhorní Karabach, Podněstří nebo Jižní Osetie v Gruzii? Um. Well, I think we're the most, the, the most wrong people to be asked about it because this conflict is not about what Ukraine wants or what Ukraine can do. This is conflict is firmly in the hands of Russia and whatever Russia wants to do or whatever the next step of Russia, we should probably seek the answer only in, inside the Kremlin. Um, and Obviously, the frustration is there because the society doesn't want this war at all at this point. So it was, uh, you know, this uh, obviously patriotic surge in the first months of the war where people, uh, especially because the army collapsed and then people would form those battalions and go to fight on the east. And it was patriotic surge all around the country, and then uh, uh, the, the the surge of uh, civil society groups, volunteers who took over the state when it comes to refugees and helping out, uh, assisting uh, in humanitarian way. But now, two years later, people are tired of this war, uh, war, and what they want to do in so many cases, especially if you travel around the region, they just want to build a wall to establish a new border and to forget about those uh, occupied territories as it happened with Crimea because people have no bandwidth at all to deal with this, uh, with this crisis anymore. Um, the economy is also, you know, everybody wants to move on. But again, it doesn't matter what Ukrainians want because Russia doesn't want, doesn't want to move on Russia doesn't want to annex that part of the territory because there is no use of it. What it does instead is uh, keep it in a kind of a frozen conflict, a constant destabilization tool. Uh, tool. Russia wants to reintegrate the eastern Ukraine back to, uh, to the state and they're very quite vocal, I think at least uh, a year, uh, for the last year, that they want to reintegration to happen. Just because they clearly understand that the war brought such an extreme polarization in the region and it also established a lot of uh, cleavages, a lot of divisions that weren't there in the first place uh, when it comes to language, when it comes to ethnicity, when it comes to politics. 
Uh, so everything is so radicalized and so different from the rest of the country now. So they see quite huge use if the territories are integrated back to the country. There will be a constant uh, disruptive force for politics. If, you know, for example, former separatists who are involved in human rights violations or war crimes suddenly become members of the parliament. Can you imagine you know, that, what that could do to the parliament that is enjoying the first time in 25 years a super majority and extremely productive because in the last two years they passed 2,000 laws, which is quite probably the most productive parliament in the world at the moment. So, you know, obviously that's what Russia wants and the only question what is gonna happen with Eastern Ukraine can be uh, answered in, in the Kremlin and it seems like we're just in a period of waiting because Russia is so preoccupied with internal issues like economy, upcoming elections, the war is not very popular inside Russia as well. So this kind of weird situation of, it's not a frozen conflict, people keep dying as we speak. Uh, but it's a, at the same time, the front line does not move either way because there is no, uh, there is no desire to push further. Well, let me let me try to make two points uh, elaborating on what Maxime said about the relationship of Ukraine to Europe and to Russia. Um, the first about Europe. One thing I, I noticed being in Vienna while the Maidan was going on is that there was in certain sense a misunderstanding about what Europe came to mean on the Maidan. I mean, I think these were protests that were initially given impetus to by Yanukovych's failure to sign an association agreement. Um, and they began as Euromaidan. But I think by December it was no longer Euromaidan, it was just Maidan. And what, what my understanding of Maidan was, and Anne, I'm, I'm an outsider so Maxime can answer this better, is that it was really a, an impassioned revolt against what in Russian is called prizvol. And, and that's a word we don't have in English, and I'm, I'm not sure how you would translate it into Czech, but it, it, it's a word that comes up for historians a lot because you know Russian liberals of the 19th century were also fighting against prizvol. And prizvol captures this idea of both arbitrariness and tyranny. The idea that you are simply an object of power as opposed to a subject. You are a place of the forces that, can, that, that be, and anything can be done to you. And what Europe, I think, came to mean on the Maidan was not the empirical, highly imperfect, often hypocritical, you know, um, plagued with its own weaknesses Europe. But Europe was the ideal essence of that platonic ideal which might represent the antithesis of Praizval. Um, and I think that understanding of Europe, Europe in its purified platonic form, played a very big role in the Maidan. And it needs sometimes to be disentangled from how Europeans then understand the empirical Europe. Um, the other thing I, I wanna say about, about Russia um, is that w one of the contributions that I thought was most important to understanding what's happening in Russia today was that the journalist Peter Pomerantsev's book nothing is true and everything is possible. And he was describing a kind of postmodern world in which there are so many alternative realities that are being constructed that you strip away one alternative reality and you just find another alternative reality and you strip that one away and there's a third alternative reality. And you never, as you peel the onion, feel that there's any actual real reality underneath. And my, my sense, especially when the war in the Donbass got started, and again, I was not in the Donbass, so I'm, I'm relying on, on other people's accounts, is that you really do have a kind of postmodern crisis of subjectivity that nobody seems to really know for sure who is who, you know, and who is a provocateur, the politics of provocatia, 
were very important. Who is a kind of authentic, ideologically convinced, local autonomist, you know, Russian nationalist, um, self-conceived freedom fighter against imaginary Ukrainian Nazis, a paid Kremlin agent, you know, a mercenary thug. Um, all of these things seem to be playing themselves out at, at once. And I'll, I'll tell two brief anecdotes that were, were told to me to illustrate this. Um, one is, is a, a colleague of mine, a very young, very talented Polish journalist named Paweł Penjanjak, who was reporting on the Donbass um, during the first six months of the war. And he finds himself in the middle of battles and people are shooting at one another. And they come up to him, the local people, and say, Nashi? Nashi? You know, are, are they our guys? Are they on our side? You know, are the ones on our side doing the shooting? And Pavel doesn't know how to answer because he doesn't know who they consider to be on their side at a given moment. And he comes to understand that they don't really know either. You know, I mean, in fact, this question, Nashi, which is seemingly absurd, is, is extremely profound. You know, what does it mean to say who's on our side at the moment when a civilian population, you know, becomes a kind of plaything of all sorts of real and imaginary forces? Um, and th the other anecdote was told to me by my friend Katya Yakovlenko, um, who, who is from Donetsk um, with a, a group called Izolatsia, a kind of discussion place, art gallery, um, salon type organization, um, and, and she fled to Kiev. And she was telling me about one of the early days in the war in Donetsk, about these different groups of people who came and you're trying to figure out who they were and some of them she kind of knew from school and some of them came from across the border. And she says, and then one day the Chechens came and they didn't even speak Russian very well. And they couldn't understand why they were getting hryvna instead of ruble from the bank machine. And then they s scheduled this meeting on Ploshad Lenina, you know, on, on Lenin Square. You know, and you know, and, and an elderly Orthodox Christian woman, Staraya Pravoslavnaya Babushka, she comes to, you know, to, to Ploshad Lenina, and she gives one of these, the Chechen soldier leader, an Orthodox christening so that he will be victorious in battle against the Ukrainian Nazis. And, and Katya, I mean, the poor Katya is banging her head against the wall, but she's like, you know, everything is surreal in this scene. You have the Christian woman on the communist square giving an orthodox christening to a Muslim soldier so that he can go kill non-existent Ukrainian Nazis. Nothing is true, it's all fiction, and yet it's all happening. Thank you, Marcy. Maybe the public has already been asked for a question for our hosts. No? Okay. Can I add it then? I think this is a very exciting topic. And another topic, how are we in this kind of environment where involved is international community? Because obviously, I personally don't believe that any conflict can be local anymore. Every conflict has repercussions or will have uh, for the, 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 uh, the greater region or for Europe, and especially in Ukraine. If country 42 million suddenly collapses and you have millions of people storming your border, that's not something you want to deal with. Um, basically, we learned that from Syria. But my, my, um, my concern is with those kind of mixed up, invented identities. And I remember quite clearly a um, couple of months, I think, three, four months after the revolution, uh, the violent part of the revolution ended. And I had this uh, conversation with uh, some uh, people who came uh, in group of uh, development, um, for development project or help with development projects and reform. And one person, she was Canadian, she was extremely smart and extremely competent, but she didn't have a lot of, um, a lot of knowledge of the region. And we sit and we talked about possible, uh, possible allies out of this crisis. And she says, what if we suggest a constitutional reform and establish um, ethnic quotas inside the government for Russian, ethnic Russians or uh, Russian-speaking people and Ukrainian-speaking people? And, and my jaw dropped because I was, I, was, I was surprised, but I was terrified by the concept coming from country, bilingual country, 
raised in families that do not differentiate whether they speak Ukrainian or Russian, they never switch when they talk to each other in two languages, in a country that is just literally impossible to tell people apart, genetically speaking, because it's a melting pot of hundreds of years of different, you know, civilizations, different uh, nationalities mixing. Um, this concept was so alien to me, but I understood even later that it's something that we do when we come to places that are ridden with conflict and crises and we try to fix them, but we don't know how, so we try to impose those invented identities that help us to better manage it. And I, I just came back from Bosnia, which is terrifyingly very similar to what is happening in Eastern Ukraine right now, because before the war, before the uh, ethnic cleansing, before the Serbia uh, got involved, they, they were an extremely diverse multicultural society without fixed, crystallized ethnic identities. What happened after the ceasefire was established in Dayton, those identities were entrenched into everything, into the constitution, in political parties, and political process. And in the end, 25, uh, 20 years later, those divisions, segregation, ethnic segregation is real. And those ethnic identities crystallized. So my friend, she's from uh, Sarajevo and she was born there and she has Serbian name, but she comes from very diverse family as all Sarajevans, most of them. So she has Bosnians and Muslims and Serbs in their family, but she has a Serbian name. And she said that even after the war, she, she never would have a problem with her name. Now, 20 years later, sometimes she's been denied contracts or uh, some uh, places refuse uh, uh, rent just because she has a Serbian name and people are openly saying, well, we're not, we're not comfortable serving uh, or working with a Serbian per person. So I think we should learn those um, lessons and be extremely cautious when we should be involved but we should study more and we should apply something that is calibrated approach rather than just coming in a very, this kind of neo-colonial way, imposing identities that help us to, to feel better or to understand the situation better. I think this still is up there and it's one of the biggest danger I fear for Ukraine that might happen. Děkuji. Uh, Maxime, ještě taková otázka asi na závěr, teda nevím, kolik je hodin. OK, máme ještě pět minut. A je to otázka, o které se také v České republice moc nemluví. Samozřejmě tím, že na východní Ukrajině zuří válka, ozbrojený konflikt, tak 1,7 milionu obyvatel takzvaných vnitřních uprchlíků se nachází na ostatním území Ukrajiny. Jestli Maxime může říct z vlastní zkušenosti, jak pomoc těmto lidem probíhá, kde jsou nejvíce, kde se nejvíce nacházejí, kde bydlí, co dělají, jestli schání práci nebo jak to všechno vypadá, protože 1,7 milionů, představme si celou Prahu, někde vysídlenou jinde v České republice. Díky. Um, scale this issue because can you imagine three million people being displaced inside the country and we don't hear their stories and we don't actually see them and especially if you go to other conflicts in developing world sometimes it's very easy to spot a refugee right because it's from different country or they're poor but in case of Ukraine the the area of conflict was um, especially cities, they were extremely wealthy. First, second, you cannot tell people apart. So if you see a person who is displayed on the street, you would never think that that person is, they don't live in refugee camps or anything like that. And I think that luckily enough, and Marcy, uh, Marcy had uh, a lot of interesting stories about volunteers who actually took the role of the state and they're uh, helping them out in so many ways. It saved the country from internal social collapse of dealing with three, uh, with over two million uh, uh, internal displaced people. But I'm not sure how long it could take for those uh, for those groups to actually call, uh, go on. And uh, resources are not so scarce. And because of this Ukraine fatigue thing, people suddenly think that you know it's not something we should uh, send resources or try to help. 
On the other hand, it's, um, I think Ukraine is lucky because all those people who left the region, um, they were young, uh, the most productive, they had their own businesses, so they left the region just because they definitely knew that there is nothing there for them uh, left to do but there are some other opportunities in, uh, in the rest of the country. It's, it's a bit weird situation in a country that nobody would depend on the state who's younger than, I don't know, like 40 years younger, uh, uh, starting from 40 years and younger. There is no mentality of de being dependent on the state because state failed us uh, when we were younger at everything. So now we kind of, we have this generation who don't care much about the state and they, you know, they are surviving on their own pretty much successfully. So all those people from like that, they all left the region. And what happened, they actually setting up small businesses elsewhere. I know the region I'm coming from next to Donetsk, um, there is a massive influx of people from Donetsk and Luhansk, what they do, they apply for jobs, they're creating small businesses, they have coffee shops, uh, the same in, is happening in Kiev. I don't know anyone who's unemployed or dependent on, you know, just aid. They're trying to work their way through it. And I think Ukraine is lucky in that way. But you have the rest of the population, 3 million, who are trapped there without any opportunities, who are mostly poor or um, much older. They didn't left just because they know that there is nothing uh, there for them elsewhere. And I think that kind of is a growing crisis uh, because I'm still surprised, really surprised that we didn't have any, um, uh, um, any major crises or, you know, uh, with, the, with food shortages and stuff like that, but it can happen at any point. We're just like very lucky and we're walking a very thin line, um, surviving just basically because of vol uh, volunteer uh, help. Uh, let me just emphasize again the point that Maxime made, that we really have a, a tendency, um, perhaps because the paradigm was so well developed for so long, to see conflicts in terms of ethnic conflicts or linguistic conflicts that are derivative of ethnic conflicts. Um, and I, that, that model also, it, it, it doesn't work and it breaks down very, very quickly. Um, what I, I have been trying to understand is that there, because the lines of division in the East so often run through families, and people are always telling me stories of how now, because they're on the Ukrainian side and someone else is on the Russian side or someone else is on the separatist side, they're no longer talking to their brothers or sisters or their cousins or their aunts and their uncles. So the breaks are running, they're running horizontally across families, but they're also very often running generationally. Um, and the point that Maxime made about the young people who are, who consider themselves Ukrainian, you know, who feel like there is a chance to build a better state, who are leaving and going to cities further west in Ukraine, and often leaving their parents who don't want to leave, or their parents who have different inclinations. And sometimes they stop speaking with their parents, and sometimes they continue to maintain relations with their parents um, across these borders, even when it's hard to go back and forth now and visit. So the way in which these conflicts are playing themselves out in families, you know, makes them very intimate and also lays bare the role of choice, you know, and how people are defining situations for themselves. Um, the other thing that I've, I've been very interested in is the way in which the conflict in the Donbass perhaps could be understood as a conflict about different conceptions of temporality. Um, and one of the things I've been trying hard to understand both through the Maidan and the Donbass is the meaning of time and the, of the experience of time um, and the way in which generational cleavages coalesce in certain particularly dramatic moments, the generation formed during the Soviet period, the generation born after the Soviet period, the generation who definitely wants decommunization, the generation who feels like their whole life is being erased in front of their eyes, um, the ones who look with nostalgia to a time in the past where there's more security, the ones who are willing to give up the security in the hopes of a more uncertain but 
but perhaps more ambitious future somewhere else or with some other conception of how the country should be, that there's a lot of different conceptions of temporality, of our experience of time, of how time moves, of the role we play in how time moves, that I think those, those are playing out in the divisions in the Donbass in a much more profound way than any kind of linguistic or, or ethnic elements are. Um, and, and I guess the last thing I, I would say about refugees more generally is that obviously not only in Ukraine, but in Europe now, we're, we're facing the largest refugee crisis um, in, in our lifetimes. Um, and and that's, that's made me think about the point that Hannah Arendt makes in, in Origins of Totalitarianism, and, and I should admit that Whenever there's any kind of political or intellectual crisis, I always think it's a good moment to go back to Hannah Arendt. You know, she, she was one of my first loves, who remains one of my great loves. Uh, but she makes a point that's now often forgotten in Origins of Totalitarianism, and where she writes about the refugee crisis, not following the Second World War, but following the First World War. Um, when all the empires in Europe, the Ottoman Empire, the, the German Empire, the Austro uh, Ottoman Empire, the Russian Empire, and the Habsburg Empire break apart, and suddenly there are nation states and you need passports, and then you have stateless people. And she says that now we know that the inviolable human rights of man that were declared in the French Revolution are in fact unenforceable outside of citizenship. And in fact, when you take away citizenship, you create a state of complete rightlessness, where there is no operative concept of human rights outside of citizenship. And she makes the argument that that was not, not the full condition, but a necessary condition for what happened during the Second World War when then the right to live itself was challenged. Já už bohužel musím dnešní debatu ukončit, i když je mi to velmi líto. Děkuji Marci Shore a děkuji Maximu Eristavi. Pokud vy tady jste nyní neměli otázky, tak oba dva naši hosté jsou na Facebooku, takže si je můžete přidat do přátel a komunikovat s nimi i na této úrovni. Děkuji organizátorům a budu se těšit i v příštím roce na viděnou, protože myslím si, že téma Ukrajiny je určitě pro nás, pro Českou republiku velmi důležité. V České republice Ukrajinci tvoří největší menšinu, žijí jich o nás oficiálně 200 tisíc. Takže děkuji a naschledanou.